Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Georgina, the board, staff, and all of you for coming out here tonight. I really do appreciate it. And as I look across this room, there's many friends in this room, and it's it's really nice to see. Uh, Georgina has acknowledged the special guest, but can I just thank again the Korean General Consul Chang Hong Yi, uh, United States Vice Consul Tom Chidiak, um, and there's many other friends, particularly former members and ministers, Dr. David Kemp, Fran Bailey, who while I was a student here, I worked for you two days a week and had a, had a front row seat on how the best marginal seat campaigner in the country conducts their business. And on a margin of 0.7, can I say how grateful I am that I had that front row seat? Because I think one of the many things we've learned from the last few years is that there's no such thing as a safe seat anymore. And, and every member of every party in every seat has to fight for the right to be there. And that comes with hard, smart work. And I'm so glad I saw you in action, Fran. As the member for the seat named after Sir Robert Menzies, it is a particular honour for me to be here. As Georgina said, this is more than a library and a museum. You have a mission, and your mission, as articulated by you, is to uphold Sir Robert's legacy by encouraging debate, learning, and inquiry. And that is a mission we should all turn our mind to. Too often, important public discussions now have a threshold contest, whether the debate can even occur. That threshold contest requires courage and conviction, sometimes to walk past an angry protest, to ignore those who question your motives rather than your ideas, to risk being shunned by colleagues or, or even your employer. Before I turn to the topic at hand, I, I want to reflect upon something of consequence that happened last Saturday and is relevant for Anzac Day. Last Saturday, Australian scientists located the wreck of a ship that sunk 81 years ago off the coast of the Philippines. Resting at twice the depth of the Titanic, the Montevideo Maru was a Japanese merchant vessel used to transport prisoners of war. It was torpedoed in 1942 by a US submarine whose crew in the fog of war were oblivious to its passengers. It sank in 11 minutes with the loss of 1,000 Australians. In 11 minutes, we lost twice the number killed in the entire Vietnam War and three times the number we lost in the Korean War. In 11 minutes, entire bloodlines were wiped out. For example, the Turner family from New South Wales lost three sons. In 11 minutes, young men were woken as the explosion roared and the water rushed in. They almost certainly tried their best to solve the problem, to find a way out. But at some point, hope would have faded, and we can only imagine what their final thoughts were. We can imagine that they were of their parents, their siblings, their partners, and for some of the older ones, their children. We can be sure that they turned their last thoughts to home, to Australia. And that is why on Anzac Day, we gather and say, lest we forget. But as the sun comes up, we must honour their legacy in a more substantial way, to turn our minds to the lessons of conflict so that we may learn and adapt. That is our duty and it is a serious one. As was mentioned by the Consul General and Georgina, the Korean War is often overshadowed by the two conflicts that sit either side of it, World War II and the Vietnam War. I was speaking with Georgina on a podcast and we were trying to work out why and maybe one of the reasons is that Hollywood made a lot of movies about it, those two wars, but less about the Korean War. And I mentioned that one of the exceptions was MASH and Georgina, like I did, thought that was about Vietnam, but it's not. MASH is about the Korean War. And hence, then, Monica, the Forgotten War. So if lest we forget is to mean something, then no war should be forgotten not least one of such significance. I was often told as a barrister to summarise your case in a newspaper headline. And I thought, what would the newspaper headline be for this address? And I think it would read something like this. Cold war becomes hot. Australia moves closer to the US. Perhaps I could leave it there and call for questions, Georgina. Uh, but if we move past the headline, 
the opening paragraphs of that newspaper article uh, would give us better context. That in 1950, North Korean units invaded South Korea without provocation. With the Soviet Union absent from New York to exercise a veto, the United Nations Security Council called for military intervention. Australia answered that call and at the end, and in doing so, helped secure ANZUS. I could ask the questions there, but it would be missing a crucial context, the role played by our Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies. Robert Menzies was the Prime Minister throughout the three-year war. This was his second time in that high office, with his term commencing seven months before the war started. And fun fact for today, today is the anniversary of his first time being sworn in as Prime Minister on the 26th of April. So this address will outline how the actions Menzies took in the Korean War continue to shape Australia's foreign policy and defence strategy to this day. And they also will shape our future. So what led to our decision to participate in another conflict far from home? The short answer is insecurity. Through the late 1940s, Australia was still reflecting on the trauma of the Second World War. Conflict in the Pacific shook our sense of security. How were we to defend an isolated island continent with a small population? We were, as we are now, a strong, hardy nation with a strong sense of self. We were known for our ability to punch above our weight, but we lacked the population and industry required for proper self-sufficient defence. Australia needed allies to, allies to survive, and there were two schools of thought, many of which are taught for those who are students of international relations. The first was liberal internationalism. This was largely championed by the Labour government of Ben Chifley, Menzies' immediate predecessor. For liberal internationalists, the key to peace lay in three key elements. Diplomacy, multilateral alliances, and international organisations. Primarily, the United Nations and the economic institutions of Bretton Woods. Robert Menzies was wary of the consequences of appeasement in the 1930s, believing liberal internationalism risked repeating those mistakes. He described it, that school of thought, as naive, dangerously utopian, and offering enlightened arbitration, not lasting security. Menzies was not one to criticise without offering an alternative, and he did. Menzies offered realism. Realism broadly seeks to understand the world as it is, not as it should be. One that places a premium on states, power and interests. When it came to security, Menzies prioritised bilateral agreements based on mutual defence. And Menzies, as we all know, had a preferred bilateral partner in mind, Great Britain. Menzies was, to quote, British to his bootstraps and an ardent anglophile, and he would remain so through his entire life. But Menzies was also a pragmatist. In the aftermath of World War II, the British presence in Asia was dwindling. The war had left the empire in retreat. With Britain shifting its focus, as it should, to Eastern Europe, Menzies needed to turn to a new partner, and that new partner was the United States. At the time, America was experiencing a golden age. It stood as a superpower without peer, with a significant naval capability. Most importantly, the United States placed the Asia-Pacific firmly within its sphere of influence. Despite all of this, Menzies was still reluctant to turn to the United States. He saw such action as capable of weakening the Anglo-Australian alliance. The United States was also reluctant. President Truman, who is, his uh, writing is in the museum downstairs and some books to Robert Menzies, said this, he was unwilling to offer mutual defence agreements to any nation which could not offer strategic assets in return. And so at that time, the status quo remained until Korea forced our hand. So how did Australia come to join the war? The lead up to the Korean 
will, will require its own lecture, and I'm not here for that. But for our purposes, hostilities began on the 25th of June 1950, when formations of Kim Il-sung's Korean People's Army crossed the 38th parallel into South Korea. And it's important to note that the Korean War ultimately finished where it started to spoil the ending. Two days later, with the support of UN Security Council Resolutions 82 and 83, President Truman announced the United States would be leading a task force of willing nations. It is important to note that the resolutions were able to pass without veto because the Soviet Union was boycotting the UN at the time for recognising the Republic of China as China. Menzies was still reluctant to join the war. He was concerned with the more pressing communist insurgency in Malaya. The distant nature of this conflict still weighed on him. That said, Menzies, like Truman, understood that the post-war rules-based order needed to be reinforced. If not reinforced, and if North Korea succeeded, it would open the door to a domino effect. Menzies was especially concerned about a future invasion of Hong Kong. By way of compromise, Menzies committed two Australian warships and an IAAF squadron to the UN force being formed to defend South Korea. No ground troops. Some believe Menzies should have gone further, including Minister for External Affairs, which is the Foreign Affairs Minister, Sir Percy Spender. Uh, you might recognise that surname, uh, the grandfather of the current member for Wentworth. Like Menzies, Spender believed establishing an alliance with the United States was critical to the future security of Australia. But Spencer, unlike Menzies, wanted ground troops in Korea. He had the foresight to see that the war provided Australia with, and I quote, an opportunity of cementing friendship with the United States, which may not easily present itself again. Menzies declined. For Menzies, if Britain wasn't in, Australia was out. And this is where it gets very interesting. The situation changed while Menzies was on a ship to America. Spender was informed that the British Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, had decided to commit ground troops to Korea. Spender lobbied for Australian ground troops to join the conflict before the British made their announcement. His assessment was that it would carry more weight. By late July 1950, Spender was successful. Acting Prime Minister Arthur Fadden, not Prime Minister Menzies, committed ground troops to the war. All of this occurred without Robert Menzies' knowledge. Despite this, Robert Menzies owned the decision. Seizing the opportunity, he used it to cement Australia's common cause with the United States. Now, it is hard for us here today to imagine an acting Prime Minister making such a decision now. Uh, you could maybe claim the Wi-Fi was down or someone was other bu otherwise busy, but uh, I don't think it would wash. And so in late September 1950, Australian troops set foot in Korea. Over 18,000 Australians would serve in the Korean War, and 339 of them paid the ultimate price, joining 36,574 US personnel who were killed in action. And I urge those of you who ever visit Washington, the, the Korean War Memorial is, is, is as spectacular as the Vietnam War Memorial, and has recently been updated with all of their names. It was a brutal conflict, fought in difficult terrain and harsh weather conditions. But despite these challenges, our soldiers fought bravely and with distinction, including in battles that became legendary, like Capillon in Marion Sand. They also engaged in humanitarian work, helping to rebuild schools and hospitals and provide medical aid to civilians in need. Lasting bonds were formed with the Korean people, and that legacy is still remembered today, as you outlined. The Korean War saw massive amounts of terrain lost, fought for, and regained many times over. Even though it ended where it started, that line changed so many times. And this is one of the reasons the war has a disproportionately high civilian casualty rate, with approximately 3 million civilians losing their lives. Major cities were destroyed, and thousands of massacres occurred. The fighting ended after three years on 27 July 1953 with the signing of the Korean Armistice Agreement. The agreement created the Korean Demilitarized Zone, the DMZ as it's known, 
and allowed for the return of prisoners. No peace treaty was signed, and the two nations are technically still at war. This hit home to me in 2013 when I was still in the army and I deployed to South Korea to, to participate in an exercise called Exercise Uchi Freedom. The exercise is one of the largest and longest running in the world. Uh, it has been run annually since 1968 when North Korean special forces launched a raid to assassinate the then president of South Korea at his official residence, the Blue House. North Korea criticizes the exercise as being in preparation for war, and South Korea and the United States counterclaim that its purpose is to prevent war. So what is the legacy of the Korean War? What we know is that the war was unpopular at its end. The lack of a true end to the conflict led to dissatisfaction. Many soldiers felt that they fought for nothing. For our national interest, Suppressi Spender was proven correct. Australia's decisive committal of truce convinced the United States that we were doing our part in the region. As a consequence, and perhaps as a direct one, the ANSYS Treaty was signed on the 1st of September 1951. Under that agreement, Australia and New Zealand, who was a member at the time, and the United States pledged as follows, to assist each other through mutual aid and to collectively develop their capacity to resist armed attack. Critically, an armed attack on any of the parties is deemed to include an armed attack on the metropolitan territory of any parties. Simply put, Australia's security was to be guaranteed by the United States. I stress the critical role of the Korean conflict in this development. Professor John Blacksland quotes, the United States would have been unwilling to sign a mutual treaty without the prompt contribution of air and land forces to Korea. The Office of the US Historian at the US Department of State notes the following. Several developments in 1949 and 1951 helped to change US perceptions about the use and utility of a formal security agreement. And it goes on to note the contribution by Australia. So ANSYS marked the adoption of the United States as our primary defence partner. Although this was not the end of the Anglo-Australian relationship, Menzies understood that power and dynamism lay in the United States. But to him, and to the end of his days, it was Britain that had the maturity and expertise, to quote Menzies, so valuable in a time of crisis. And for Menzies, he singled out a particular decisions by General Douglas MacArthur through the war, where in a series of tactical successes, General MacArthur kept going and going advancing to the Yalu River, and that made Menzies nervous about complete reliance on the US. And so Menzies continued to nurture the relationship with Britain. We followed the British into Malaya and Rhodesia, and even allowed the British to conduct nuclear testing in Australia. Britain remained fully engaged in our region until 1970, and this year was marked by British withdrawal west of the Suez. From that moment on, the United States stood as our primary defence partner. So the tilt from Albion to America, begun by the actions of the Menzies government in 1950, was, in 1970, complete. And this was an immense shift for a new ally in a new direction. The war in Korea did not just shape who our allies were, it shaped their role in Australia's future. The long-held question of alliance or self-reliance received an answer. Menzies ultimately sided with alliance, and it was the Korean War that led him to this conclusion. Menzies had known for a long time the pitfalls of self-reliance. Independent defence policy is, was, and always will be a hugely expensive endeavour, and you would have seen the numbers that are required for the AUKUS submarine deal. The Korean War demonstrated we have another option. Joint military deployments with great powers worked. It was a highly attractive model that had been established. Menzies believed he saw the future of the Australian Defence Force. He stated Australian forces would only operate in close collaboration with our great and powerful friends. And for self-reliance, he ruled it out. And in this decision, this redefined the objectives of Australian foreign and defence policy. Australia's primary defence objective was now to keep the US and UK engaged 
in Southeast Asia. Our military and diplomatic resources were devoted to this objective from Korea onwards. The reaction of the United States to Australia's involvement in Korea made something clear. Our allies will be willing to defend, to defend us if we provide them with moral and tangible military support when they need it most. And only if we do this. Korea fundamentally intermeshed Australian foreign and defence policy. How did the ADF change after Korea? Quite a lot. The ADF was to be at the centre of this new foreign policy. It was to become a tool of diplomacy, not self-defence. Australia's primary security objective was to keep our allies on side, and our security forces were key to this. The logic was quite simple. Our great and powerful friends will intervene here with us if the ADF intervenes there with them, wherever that may be. And if you leave aside the intervention in East Timor, Australia has not fought in a conflict without the UK or the US since. And even in East Timor, and I remember watching the 1999 Interfed decision, which um, um, Mrs Bailey and, and Kemp would have been a part of, uh, I remember reading the articles that the US Marines were stationed on a ship uh, not far away. So foreign interventions can act like insurance, insurance premiums, but do they have to be all-consuming national endeavours? Korea proved even small but meaningful deployments could make a difference. Compared to World War II, 18,000 soldiers were what it took for the United States to pledge support to our defence. And Menzies recognised this cost-benefit ratio. But this required a new strategy for the ADF. Quality had to overtake quantity. It meant having a professional military, professionally trained and professionally equipped. To follow our partners where they meant, meant globally deployable forces. And in that respect, the ADF changed from a very, mostly an amateur force drawn throughout this country to a professional, professionally paid force that was ready to deploy anywhere in the world. So how can we summarise the lessons of Korea? I would like to highlight three. First, the Korean War proved foreign interventions can be rational, but they require the legitimacy of public support. They make sense because they strengthen our alliances. Strong alliances prevent the need for self-reliance. Not needing to be self-reliant keeps defence budgets down. And that is something that policymakers can be honest about, and I think Australians get it. Our alliances don't just make our self-defence more cost-effective, they make our budgets work. The public knows this, and it is no surprise that more than 70% of Australians in a recent poll support AUKUS. But our alliances can only be maintained if we continue to support our partners. Participation in foreign interventions is how we demonstrate this support. It is not always popular, and policymakers must better explain and articulate its importance. The second lesson is perhaps more a tactical one, in that succeeding in conflict requires fixed objectives. The first half of the Korean conflict was in every respect, a tactical success. In a few months, coalition forces pressed North Korean troops back to where they started at the 38th parallel and kept going. South Korea was saved from communist aggression. The objective of the UN was achieved. Back in the United States, a prominent radio host declared victory in Korea. But it was at that point that US commanders shifted, shifted their objectives. The US wished to eliminate the communist presence on the peninsula. General MacArthur was authorised to fight until the Yalu River. And this would prove to be disastrous. The push drew China into the conflict. The Western public was also disillusioned by the continuation of the invasion, which was, to them, no longer a defence of democracy, freedom and international rule of law, but in the pursuit of crushing an enemy. The war continued until 1953, with countless increases in casualties. The Yalu River advance was poorly thought out and had devastating consequences. 
So strategic goals are a matter of national policy. If not articulated and enforced, operational commanders may not know when to stop, and the public forgets what it is fighting for. The third lesson is this. How the war ends matters as much, if not more, than how it was fought. This does not mean we prefer armistice to genuine peace, but it does mean we prefer armistice to giving up. The Korean War has not ended. It remains in a tense armistice, but there is peace. There is victory in stability. It is possible for two sides in a conflict to divide up a piece of land and live side by side in relative peace. Neither side surrendered, neither compromised their core beliefs, but peace through tense stability is present. And can I contrast this with another conflict, being the end of the Afghanistan war and the fall of Kabul? On any measure, that was a disaster. For the people of Afghanistan, for peace, and for those who sacrificed for the hope of something better. Afghanistan was an unwinnable war, but we knew that at the time but we thought it could have ended better. The Taliban could not and would not be vanquished. But that did not mean the entire nation had to be handed over to a group that drew its legitimacy from only a portion of the population. Instead, the more liberal Kabul and ethnically diverse provinces to the north are now ruled by a regime that does not recognize or tolerate their wishes to live a different life. Forever wars are not appealing. But I wonder what a small, enduring presence might have achieved for the people of Afghanistan. Perhaps a negotiated path to a federation like we have, where the diverse people could find a way to live and let live. And in the same way that the US presence in Korea continues to send a signal to deter aggressive acts, I feel that abandoning Afghanistan sent the reverse signal, arguably giving comfort to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Donald Rumsfeld was wrong about a lot of things, but I think he was right about this, that weakness is provocative. So to conclude, the Korean War profoundly shapes our defence and foreign policy as we find it today. The Menzies government saw an opportunity and took it. Because of that, we find ourselves in a strong and stable alliance with the United States. It is because of this alliance that we have a small, nimble, highly trained, and highly sophisticated defence force. The legacy of the Korean War can be found at all levels, from AUKUS meetings to the weapons Australian soldiers use on the battlefield. Korea taught us that alliances are won at a cost. We must treasure and nurture them, because in the end, we, as a nation like people, should be judged upon what we do, not what we say. If we were to return to the newspaper metaphor I said at the start and rhetorically ask this question, was it worth it? I think of something an Afghanistan veteran said to me in 2021. He said that the fall of Kabul caused him to question why we were there. But he added this months later, maybe, maybe what we did helped get us focus. He said he could be proud of that. We could say the same to Korean veterans, that their sacrifice helped get us answers. And in both ways, they helped keep our nation secure. But there is a legacy for Korea that we can be particularly proud of. And I think the newspaper would answer it with one picture. The Korean Peninsula at night. It is a picture taken from space by NASA. On the south is a nation of 50 million people that are free and prosperous, beaming bright. On the north is a nation of 25 million people, imprisoned and in total darkness, save for a few sprinkles of light that house the elite. That alone is a legacy that was worth fighting for and one that we can all be proud of. Thank you, Keith. I think you'll all agree that was a, a 
fantastic address from one of our real up-and-comers in the federal parliament. It's so wonderful to know that there are people as thoughtful and considered and, and I think um, who come with not just the academic background, professional background, but also that um, background in, you know, deep thinking about Australia's place in the world, that these types of people are in our federal parliament making the decisions that may one day matter very much to us in the future. Uh, Keith has agreed to answer a few questions. Uh, so I do have Will Cook there at the back if any of you would like to answer, um, ask Keith a question. We only have about 15 minutes for questions, but I will ask the first one to uh, ease you all into it. Uh, Keith, as you know, I was in Taiwan last week as a guest of the, the government of Taiwan on an extremely interesting delegation with uh, academics and think tank people from Australia and um, as you were describing South Korea as free and prosperous and the contrast with North Korea um, it did make me reflect on the two Chinas the China of Republic of China of Taiwan which is uh, free and under a democratic rule um, it is prosperous and across the Taiwan Straits, the China of the PRC, which um, maybe have, have some prosperity, but certainly is not free. Uh, as we go into the next decade, and we obviously have the announcement of the Defence Strategic Review on Monday, uh, which was, I think, a, a, a wake-up call for many in the Australian community about the very tough decisions that will have to be made. I wondered if you could... Um, give me your reflections on how Australia navigates what sort of commitment we'd have towards Taiwan. And I do note that a, um, a certain opposition leader in 1993 was asked a similar question and got into hot water and I may or may not be related to him. So. <laughs> thank, thank you, Georgina. Um, I, I, we, we had a podcast interview before this, and um, I should probably keep my answer consistent so <laughs> that they don't diverge. Uh, when we invest in our military and engage in foreign policy, our purpose isn't to fight and win wars. Our purpose is to win a war game. Because before any conflict may occur, a decision is made for that to occur. And our job in acquiring capability building resilience and forming alliances is to make that exercise one that is too costly to ever undertake. And, and many refer to that as deterrence. Because I was young enough growing up in the 1980s when cartoons were interrupted for a news flash that I thought at the time this was nuclear war and the world was going to end. That, that was quite well known to children who grew up at that time. Those nuclear weapons haven't gone away. And, and we live in just as dangerous a world. So the, so the prospect of total interstate war is, is so catastrophic that we must use every tool that we have available to avoid it. And the most important mission is to have every decision maker in every regime, no matter how totalitarian that is, recognise that cost is too much for them to bear. Um, but that doesn't come by accident and it comes with investing in capability. Uh, I'm, I'm sure... Uh, uh, Fran and David have been at many announcements, and, and that's the easy part. The hard part is the delivery, and delivering military equipment and capability is very challenging. And particularly when you look at the capability that's been promised with AUKUS, uh, we're dealing with three nations who have their own interests and bureaucracies and democracies, and we're already having some within the United States Congress who are saying maybe the workforce isn't ready to deliver it. And I have full confidence in the United States government and Congress to overcome those challenges, but they require persistent effort because we all know when you announce something, often middle management can kill it. And there's nothing like middle management in defence bureaucracy. And, and Fran, you, you would have seen that at play. So, so there are huge challenges to deliver the capability that we need so that any adversary figures that the wolf game is one that they would lose. This gentleman and then Howard. Why do you want to wait for the mic? Just so everyone can have the benefit of your question too. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm Langford Simmons. I'm a 
Thane of Keith. Um, and I would like to welcome the Consul General. I think that's wonderful. My uncle served in Korea on the army. And uh, my father uh, told me a story which mightn't appeal to the Nazis fans, but everyone, don't forget this side of this nation when it wasn't the UK. So, uh, but I've got a question, having spent quite a lot of time in South Korea doing business there for a number of years, um, I was always impressed on Tuesdays when the, when the bombs went off and everybody jumped under the, down into the, you know, all the shopping centres were off the main street, not far from the blue, the blue house. One of the things I've whether you've looked in your research, Peter, is that MacArthur was, you know, a great supporter and everything else, and he was fine. I can somewhat impress the truth because you did a lot to explain that. That's right. And, he, and when you say press the trigger, press use nuclear weapons. And that, and that, when you think about that, 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 that was a pivotal turning point in world history because we now look back on the use of nuclear weapons in World War II as, a, as an isolated event. Uh, but that wasn't always the case, and that could have been the, a, a turning point where they were used tactically. And as we know, you use something tactically, someone responds accordingly. And, 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 and that is an excellent example of civilian control of the military, and we must always have civilian control of the military. And, and there's a lot of reflection about what went wrong with Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and one of the things I think we can reflect upon is maybe there should have been greater civilian control of the military and maybe it might have turned out differently. Thank you Keith and um, just quickly I'm glad there's somebody of ex-military fighting fit because fabulous Fran here, babe, he's got her Peter attraction outfit for the activists and I think we might need protection. Anyway, um, I think what the Benzies would have understood that the Chinese, correct me if I'm wrong, due to the one child policy, have at their peak their officers about your age. And the Chinese have an old saying wolf ahead, tiger behind. Always dangerous to go forward, but much more dangerous to stand still and go back. And finally, Dean Ed E said, it is useless for the sheep to pass resolutions on vegetarianism while the wolf is of a different opinion. I think Menzies would appreciate that today. Thank you. Um, there's a few comments in there, but, but to, to the question, I again, I was in talking with Georgina in the podcast, we, we reflected upon what the war game would look like and how uh, different cultural perspectives on what's rational are important. Uh, and also we rely the war game to be rational and work where there's complete information. Now in a Western democracy, we feed that information up and down to our decision makers. That doesn't always happen in an autocracy. And, and there's real questions about whether Vladimir Putin is being fed the information he needs to make rational decisions. But the other thing that we discussed was the effect of the one-child policy on decision-making in China. And uh, when we reflect upon World War I and World War II, many of the families, including Sir Robert Menzies' own family, sat around the dinner table and said, well, sons one, two, and three can go to the war. Sons four, you're too smart. You've got to come here. Now, if your only bloodline is one person, the costs of war are different. And whether it's a democracy or a totalitarian state, in different respects, you draw your legitimacy from your population. That has to be a factor in the war game. It shouldn't encourage complacency, but, but I think it's an important consideration here. Yeah, Keith, um, there are scholars who argue that Australia should not be so reliant on the United States in terms of defense issues. Uh, so, for example, Clinton Fernandez, who's an academic at the University of New South Wales, has written an interesting book, recent book, Sub-Imperial Power, where basically argues that Australia has become a sub-imperial power of the United States and basically does the bidding 
And, and I think that you, know, White, at ANU, has made similar arguments. So, so there are some very serious scholars that are saying, well, maybe we're a little bit too reliant on the U.S. So um, what do you make of those kinds of arguments? In our democracy, of course, we should have those arguments and welcome those discussions. But I, I respectfully disagree. Australia is a sovereign nation that will always act in its own interests. Uh, it, it may be that you, you, a scholar could look at the decisions that have been made and have aligned with the United States, but, but, but they've all been made in our own interests and they've been all been made um, uh, with, with, with a proper consideration of the consequences. It's not a blank check for every decision going forward and, and particular governments will, will make up their own minds on particular conflicts. But, but I think underlying that proposition is some sort of compromise of our sovereignty, which which I don't accept. Thank you, Keith, uh, for some excellent remarks. Um, that image you drew to our attention of the two career careers is a very striking one. You finished on a on a hopeful illustration of that image of what we've built, of what we've helped helped to build in Korea. But there is, I suppose. Um, a sadder image of that, which is what is left. Uh, to your point about you know, how Australia finds ways to build that better world that we want, um, an international system that's more aligned to our interests, it does come with the fact that being a smaller country, we can't, you know, we can't force the world in every corner to be exactly as we'd like to see it. Um, I suppose looking around at the world today, where do you think we should be prioritising our effort to make those humanitarian interventions in those those countries that are in need of assistance, where do you think we should be turning our attention, the limited attention that we have, to lift people out of the, the state that they might find themselves in? Um, I, I deployed four times with the Australian Army, to three to Afghanistan, the other side of the world, and one to East Timor. And I, I understood and respected what we were doing in Afghanistan, and particularly in reinforcing our alliance. But I felt like we made more good of the world in our region. Uh, what we did in East Timor, I think, was um, it was more consequential, and it's something that we can react to and keep an eye on more broadly. So uh, we should always be engaged in the world. We should always be a reliable partner. But, but I think in our region of the world, we, we, we have an enormous opportunity to be a good neighbour and, and to help our neighbours. And so many of our citizens come from this region. Uh, that, that just makes sense to me that this should be our focus. Thank you, Keith. Mary Joggle. I'm wondering whether you could comment on the current environment we find ourselves in. Um, I'm constantly worrying about the current debate. Our focus seems to be very narrow particularly in the context of our forthcoming referendum. There are so many other critical issues which face us as a nation in a very turbulent and dynamic and ever-changing world. Um, we've recently had some announcements in regard to a cut in regard to certain funding and a focus on others. Are you able to make any comments in terms of where you see where our current government is taking us, uh, particularly given Georgina's comments? When I listen to you about South Korea, to me, the intervention in a way said we're not going to allow this country to become a communist country. Where does all of the current environment put us where, for example, President Biden said that America will go to war over Taiwan? Our lack of action in certain countries may have given Putin licence to invade Ukraine. It seems to me a very dynamic environment and very challenging to try and see where we should be if we're going to defend ourselves as a tiny nation in a vast continent and clearly unable to defend ourselves without appropriate alliances and appropriate perceptions by those in the world that are very hostile to us. I may have the, the source of this quote wrong, but I think it was Henry Kissinger and Deputy Consul McCartney who said, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. And, and I've always thought that was a sensible way to conduct defence and foreign policy. 
I understand that there's limited bandwidth to have national debates, but but I'm I'm not too worried that, about talking about multiple things at once. I, I think the Australian people have the capacity to engage in that. Uh, I'm not too worried that we announce the strategic review the day before Anzac Day. That didn't bother me. Uh, I, I think we can chew gum and walk at the same time. I think this nation is mature enough to have a debate about amending our constitution as long as we treat each other with respect and dignity and don't say one side is about history and the other side is about being nasty. That's, that's not how these things work. So if we're mature and respectful, we, we can have all of these conversations and debates. Uh, but I would rather, when it comes to foreign policy and national security, uh, we're often surprised at how effective and good we are because we didn't talk about Deputy Chair of that, sort of, yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you've got off spot free, I think. Um, but well deserved. Thank you so much for your address tonight. Um, please put your hands together. Thank you. <laughs>